Because you can fake for a long time, but one day you're going to show yourself to be a phony. That's for true. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what these, you know, a lot of people are doing these days. Watch people. No. You probably won't be here right now. Mm -hmm. of life and I'm Gary Bird. You're inside of the GBE on this Monday afternoon, May 9th, 1988. Thank you for joining us in the experience. As I promised my guest this afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson, psychologist, author, professor, and entrepreneur. He is the author of the Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, which was published in 1978 by Africana Research Publications in Harlem. He's born and raised in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and takes a rather radical view towards the educational process and redefining it in order to educate African children according to their very own psychology. Uh, Dr. Wilson, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have good you. Good afternoon. Us. It's a pleasure to be back here. We started off the broadcast this afternoon dealing with a question, and some callers are we're still with us on the line. Uh, mm -hmm. What can be done to disarm uh, the school system as it stands today, and how does the changing atmosphere of the school system with the kind of metal detectors and uh, mm -hmm. police involvement and so forth affect children who do want to learn? What are your thoughts about that question before we really begin? Well, certainly um, the school atmosphere must be controlled and dealt with. For instance, I, there, there was the controversial Joe Clark situation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my feelings are mixed. I certainly am uh, on his side as far as the idea that order must be brought about within the uh, school structure and some kind of learning environment um, be maintained. And you cannot maintain a learning environment when uh, people are afraid for their lives or there are strangers intruding into the school in, in a threatening sort of way. And uh, just where there's general disruption and, and students have overstayed their time and, and uh, whose concerns are disruptive to other students. Mm -hmm. uh, preferably, I would, uh, would, uh, would see, like to see a control, in a sense, by the principal and by the school personnel itself. I'd prefer that the police not be brought into the situation. And of course, if, we, if it could be helped, certainly metal detectors and that kind of atmosphere should not be uh, put into the schools are uh, only there as a last resort when nothing else works. But I believe there are other workable ways of controlling the uh, school atmosphere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the school circumstances. But we must, the, the administration and the community must gain control of what goes on within the school. Uh, house in the school building itself. When you say that you think that there are other approaches, what do you mean by that? Well, it, it, I'm basically, I'm talking about, uh, I don't have such definite approaches in mind, but I'm relying on our ability to, uh, to come together as a community to, to uh, arrive at those approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that means uh, parental controls, uh, some other uh, group of, of uh, community organization, uh, patrolling or the reduction in, in the sizes of schools. Sometimes I think these schools are really absolutely too large. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in terms of the kind of students we uh, deal with here where you have maybe two or three thousand students in, in one building. Um, where often then the principals and other people in the school uh, have a greater difficulty in getting to know the students and getting a sense of where students are supposed to be uh, and what they're supposed to be doing. Hmm. So uh, those things might be instituted uh, as well. But some, in some way, the community itself must be involved, and parents and people whose children attend these schools should be involved in organizing a way of controlling the uh, atmosphere of the school. What that will be, I think, will be flexible depending on the community. When we tie in your remarks in the last broadcast dealing with psychological stereotyping and its mm -hmm. effect on African people, mm -hmm. uh, let's maybe aim that for the moment at the children. Mm -hmm. and, and I know you've given a lot of attention to this. Yes. How does that particular issue play into our own perception of ourselves in terms of the children? The, uh, you were referring to the statement I think I made toward the end of the program when I talked about the system of oppression being an immaturizing 
process. Uh, when the other people say may refer to us as boys, it is not just an attempt to put us down, but it is a part of an attempt to actually create in uh, grown men this the an immature personality. That immature personality, of course, being one that cannot successfully uh, challenge the system as it is, and that is achieved by with uh, withholding certain. Uh, experiences from our children in the schools, certain experiences in life, those experiences being necessary for uh, growth and development and growth into manhood and into uh, to womanhood. Uh, so the, the poorness of schools are a part of that process. Job discrimination is a part of that process. Uh, bringing about a feeling of uh, powerlessness and, and direct and overreactive opposition to our desires and wishes is also a part of that process because these things are used to create in us a sense of powerlessness and inability to do something about ourselves and maintain in us a state of dependence which is quite characteristic of young children. Uh, so this, the, the, the oppressive system is set up by its very restrictions and by its stereotypes, you see, to create a mentality that retards uh, mental and psychological growth. It is there also not only to immaturize us as people in general, but to feminize us as men uh, as well. Hmm. Uh, to, to emasculate the, the black man. And of course, we've talked about that a great deal, you know, and sure on these microphones. Um, you can see that even in the kind of leadership we provide. And when I use that word feminize, I'm speaking of it in the old stereotypical sense of, um, of where a certain dependency was created and maintained. Where the, let, let me just be more straightforward about it. In the older sense, before uh, liberation or uh, before the impact of women's liberation became very apparent and effective, Often many women, and not all women by any stretch of the imagination, thought that their route to, say, power and prestige and acceptance was basically through marriage, through becoming attached to some man and assuming his name or his identity. And therefore, she would get a vicarious kind of power if her husband was powerful, mm -hmm. if she carried the name of the husband and so forth. And so her major approaches under that old system was one of seduction, that is, seducing a man perhaps into marriage, producing him, seducing him into attachment, or sometimes a process of inducing guilt, or a sense of protectiveness on the part of the man, you know, these kinds of things. Or her greater, uh, the greater part of her energies might have been directed toward making herself attractive instead of developing her intellectual and other potentials. So her approach in the older sense, and I want to be clear about that because I don't yes. want any misunderstandings yeah. of people. In the older sense then, it was going at power indirectly through attachments. Now to a good degree, I think that the assimilationist approach to the movement of our people is a very similar one and sort of feminine in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's not an approach that directly challenges the power of Europeans or the power of the white men. It is not an approach that is ready to go to war and to defeat our enemies. It's, it, when we talk about racism, you see, we talk about racism, but we don't talk about it in a way that we can neutralize the races. We talk about it more in the way of getting the racist to change his or her attitude or to change their feelings toward us or to accept us, in a sense, to marry us and to become one with us. Hmm. Uh, but there's another way, of course, approaching it that, said, that says, look, you can be as racist as you want to. You can hate me and you can, you can despise me, but you are not in a position to do a damn thing about it because I have power to prevent you from carrying out your racist plans, um, you see. And, and yeah, we, of course, now yeah. again, stereotypically, see that as a masculine approach. And again, I'm using it just as a term of convenience that says, look, we are moving from a position of power. And we are not, we are not, 
we want to build our own IBM, uh, 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 IBMs, our own Xerox corporations, our own armies, our own nations, and not marry in to you and become attached to you through some kind of curious identification with you. Because what happens is that still leaves you disarmed. It still leaves you in a position uh, that if your husband divorces you, you are, you are not in a position to carry on your own life and protect your own interests. It still leaves you in a position that if your quote unquote husband decides that he will attack you or drop you in some kind of way, uh, they still doesn't prepare you to provide for yourself and to take care mm -hmm. of yourself. Mm -hmm. So integrationism that does not set us up for the assumption of real power and real control of the means of production and so forth is, in my uh, way of viewing it, a type of feminist approach. Mm -hmm. You okay, see. we're going to take a break for news mm -hmm. headlines in the half hour. Mm -hmm. And for those of you listening who may have some questions already, and I'm sure some of you do, six nine two nine five four two in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, Long Island, Staten Island, in New Jersey, upstate and out of state, one eight hundred three three two one zero two three. My guest this afternoon is Dr. Amos Wilson. If you had an opportunity of catching a version of a uh, Tony Brown's journal yesterday, uh, you probably uh, have some very interesting points of view uh, to maybe share with us this afternoon. Hearing our guest remarks. This afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, that program uh, featured a number of uh, black homosexuals uh, who were in the broadcast and who uh, had some rather unique views related to the issue of uh, feminization and also the issue of stereotyping as well. Some of them may be listening. If you are, then you are free to call us as well. That'll add another dimension to the conversation this afternoon. And we'll also come back to pick up a bit on the points that Dr. Amos Wilson has projected and also to expand a bit on the issue of psychological stereotyping and its effect on African people. As you've heard him indicate, uh, it is his feeling that oppression uh, creates an immaturization of the mind and that that is one of the things that we have to deal with. And I think that when we go back to talking about the issue of young people, to some extent, what they may be showing us is a rejection of that particular value system. We'll come back and explore that with Dr. Wilson and you right after news headlines. Very good experience. from WLIB Radio in the Key of Life and you're inside of the GBE on this Monday afternoon, May 9th, 1988. Our guest this afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson, psychologist, author, professor, and entrepreneur at the Harlem Graphic Arts Center at 243 West 125th Street. Joining us this afternoon in part two of our conversation, dealing with educating black children according to their own psychology, and this afternoon bringing in a rather interesting dimension, and an important one as well, on the issue of psychological stereotyping and its effect on African people. Uh, Dr. Wilson, as you've heard in the last few moments, talks about how oppression uh, creates a immaturization of the mind. And this afternoon, uh, Dr. Wilson, as you were talking just a few moments ago in terms of our identification uh, with integration mm -hmm. and what you call the kind of feminization, uh, if you will, of us uh, as, as men and as a people, mm -hmm. um, there was something that you were referring to as far as the idea of moving from helplessness into power positions mm -hmm. that I found interesting because in terms of the sort of dimension you were talking about, it had a, a definite Marcus Garvey ring to it, oh, but it also made me reflect a bit on Booker T. Washington and what uh, mm -hmm. I guess some might look at as a kind of flip side of the coin. Was, was Booker T. Washington in this context that we're talking about actually attempting to make these kinds of steps that we're discussing now. I think it could have um, developed in, in that direction. Mm -hmm. Certainly the practical side of um, what he was advocating the, uh, would have been of great importance to us. The part where you said um, <clears throat> conceivably you put a person in a position or a group of people in a position where mm -hmm. you may not like me you may say whatever you wish, but right. I have rendered you helpless right. to stop me. Yes. Could that have been something that, that you That could have been the, uh, the outcome of it, because how can you really uh, do that if you are still uh, dependent uh, and, and um, more dependent than you need to be on other individuals when you need not only their economic 
uh, aid, but you also need their psychological acceptance. And to a great degree, a lot of the integrationist movement was motivated by a need for psychological acceptance and by a desire, and, and often we've confused that movement with education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the idea, you know, I, I sometimes derisively say, it, these people sort of moved as if two plus two can't be four in Harlem. <laughs> you know, that you, you got to go outside to learn the two plus, but two plus two is four in Harlem, two plus two is four in a black school, mm -hmm. the same way it is in a white school. It's not really necessary that uh, our children go to these other people's schools to learn uh, what is necessary for them to know. Um, even though this was projected this way, apparently, by some people, be, but which really covered over the need of, among uh, some of these people to really be loved and accepted. And, and often that need overshadows their academic needs to the extent where, in some instances, if you can demonstrate that a, a predominantly black school or all-black school is academically superior to a white one, there will still be many of us motivated to take our children over to the white one. The, and, and often I've heard this where the parent says, well, you know, I want them to learn to live with other people and this and that, you know, all kinds of little phony excuses that we get. Uh, and the idea being uh, what is most important to, to them is the acceptance and love of these other people rather than the academic and character preparation of their uh, own children. Mm. And where it's the acceptance and love by these people uh, which becomes the the key motive uh, for our behavior rather than power. Now, before we go to our phones, mm -hmm. there were a number of our callers when we posed our question this afternoon, uh, which mm -hmm. you responded to towards the top of the broadcast uh, mm -hmm. of what can be done to disarm the school system and how does the uh, changing environment affect the children who do want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about those children in the school system, a number of our callers seem to point towards the dimension of the school system which they didn't feel was motivating. That there mm -hmm. were young people who were going to school who are basically being fed and given information that really does not give them a motivating vision of themselves of or their role in society sure. or history. How do you feel about that and how that ultimately leads that's, to the kind of dropout rate that we see? That's the way it has to be under a system of oppression. As we stated in our last conversation, the idea that the oppressor will give you a liberating education is a contradiction <laughs> in terms. And to expect, the, uh, I sometimes graphically put it this way, <clears throat> if the domination of Europeans depends upon our ignorance, and to a certain degree it does, mm -hmm. and on a number of other factors, then the schools will educate you into ignorance. It becomes the function of the school to make you ignorant. The school is not going to, we have to recognize one thing, the function of all the, the institutions in this society is to maintain the status quo. There are, there are no exceptions. The school is not an exception to that need uh, for the Europeans to maintain uh, uh, power and domination over black people. Uh, as in any other institution, whether it's the family institution, whether it's the criminal justice institution, whether it's the economic institutions, the church you name the social institution and you'll find that all of them have in common in relationship to black people the maintaining of us in a position of uh, subordination. This puts an and, 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 and therefore when they, when they relate to us mm -hmm. they will work in a way that is in opposition yeah. to their parent title mm -hmm. and, and therefore education is going to ultimately make you dumb. This Even while it's giving you information. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there, there is a kind of ed education that doesn't give you anything, mm -hmm. that leaves you really totally ignorant. Right. And then there's the education that has given you all the wrong kind of information, or the information has been set up in a context where it is, it is unusable. Let me, let me just give you a quick illustration okay. of it, because let's use an area that most people see as neutral let's say science okay fine <laughs> okay mm -hmm. and some people say well how can you be racist in science you know and Adam is an atom and a this is that uh, you know physics is physics and and engineering is engineering you see however you have to recognize that there is a sociology of science that science does not develop just from genius alone even though this is the way it's usually taught in the Eurocentrically oriented school. That, uh, for instance, physics was advanced by Einstein's brain. Okay, but physics was not necessarily advanced by Einstein's brain. It was advanced by a particular political social system. 
and Einstein happened to exist in that system. If he had the same brain and existed outside of that system, he would not have made that contribution. That contribution that Einstein made is only possible within a cultural setting and within a cultural context, you see. Therefore, science is produced not by merely by having some scientific geniuses, but by having a particular set of political economic circumstances uh, existent at a time. And those circumstances motivate scientific thinking, creativity, research, and development, you see. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is not enough just to teach a black student in a physics class the principle of physics. That student should also learn the politics of science, the economy of science, and the connection between science, politics, economic development, and other things. Because as a black scientist, he must not only know the technique of science, he must know how to become a politician and create the political, social, economic atmosphere necessary uh, the, for science to take place. And for, uh, otherwise, you'll have exactly what we have today. The production of black scientific geniuses working for NASA and other organizations, IBM, AT&T, uh, who are producing for the very people we are talking about as oppressing us because they have no economic and social system to operate uh, within so that their genius can be used to the advancement of black people. I'm going to ask you a question before we go to our lines, mm -hmm. and boy, we've got a full lineup uh, of mm -hmm. telephone callers, but you provoked this question as well. Mm -hmm. um, does this set up a uh, matrix where there is a need to differentiate in terms of the consciousness that you just described mm -hmm. in that particular uh, personality between a black American and an African American? I, I sort of use them somewhat... In they, they tend to be used interchangeably, interchangeably even though you can't make some fine points. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, <laughs> because when you, when you said that, I mean, conceivably, mm -hmm. that individual that you just described could have been a, a mm -hmm. person who was climbing the ladder of mm -hmm. success, uh, doing all the things that, that one does to move in the society yes. and yes. staying out of problems, and ultimately they achieved the professional status, right. but they did not have the consciousness. And in that sense... Does that make the black American, in the mm -hmm. terms of the one who is into just being a black, mm -hmm. who is part of the American system, yes. different from a person who is an African? In that sense, they are, particularly if you use the word African uh, in the sense of being Afrocentric, yes. of a person who is consciously and, and chronically concerned with how his talents and abilities can contribute to the advancement uh, and the survival of black people. Mm -hmm. And in the context uh, of the, the scientist, uh, the African-American in that instance is not going to be satisfied with just making it to the top. He is going to become concerned very much with transferring knowledge and information over to the African scene. He's, go he's going to recognize that uh, he cannot accept the role as it is defined by Europeans. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and when we get back, and when we talk about education, one of the things I try to get across to black teachers, you cannot accept the definition of teacher as it is defined by Europeans. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. uh, our definition of ourselves as professionals, as, as African-American professionals, must be broader than the way Europeans define themselves, you see. Mm -hmm. Because the Europeans already have an infrastructure built. They already have their economic, social, political system set up. And therefore, their teachers and professionals can act almost as technicians or technocrats. But whereas we as Africans were trying to create a system, a political, social, economic system, uh, it means then that we as black professionals must have, besides our professional interests, political, hmm. uh, political, economic, and other interests. Mm -hmm. And we must have a working knowledge as to how those, those interests impact uh, upon our profession and how we can use our profession uh, in tandem with those interests mm -hmm. to develop a nation and to develop a sense of uh, peoplehood. So the black teacher, the African teacher, cannot just be a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, he or she must also uh, be involved politically mm -hmm. with trying to change the political structure uh, of the, the system of which they are part. They cannot even be a ninth grade teacher. 
<laughs> okay, mm -hmm. a seventh grade teacher, because that 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 him that hinders people. For instance, a teacher that uh, defines himself or herself as a seventh grade teacher uh, is often in the dilemma when the vast majority of the students or a large percentage of the students come coming into his or her grade room classroom is not at the seventh grade level, and many of them then are caught in the dilemma of not meeting the students at the level in which they enter the room because they view themselves as seventh grade teachers and yeah, yeah, and yeah. and not as teachers of human beings and not as teachers of the students that confront them mm -hmm. and 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 they feel demeaned then if they have to say teach on a sixth grade level in in what they consider a seventh grade class and they feel frustrated upset or they may not really go into uh, teaching these children with any enthusiasm because of the definition. Before you go to the phone, let me just um, uh, touch on one or two things because we got involved with the purpose of education uh, last week and I, I mentioned that I want to just add when we talk about the education of our children we must not only look at uh, education as a preparation for jobs mm -hmm. and a preparation for social mobility, which you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, a while ago, which is also a part of education, obviously. Sure. Mm -hmm. But we must uh, look at education as a, as a preparation for revolution. Mm -hmm. I've often stated that the central focus of the education of the white child is conservative to maintain the advantage that uh, whites already have, that Europeans already have, and to advance those interests. So it's essentially conservative, keeping what they have and enhancing what they have. Uh, since we have little and we have much to gain, our education cannot be the same. That's the reason why I attack the concept of same education, equal education as really being meaningless in the context in which, how do we have the same education as a white child when the goals, our goals are so different? In fact, our goals may involve taking back what they have stolen from us. And you have to prepare and educate the children to do that. Uh, but to, to give them the same education assumes that they have the same goals, mm. you see. And so when we see our children, our people subordinated all over this globe, uh, um, they're having their wealth taken and exploited and, and, and destroyed. Uh, we see our position in this world, a large majority being ruled over by a minority. We are talking about revolution. And the children should be, be, um, be educated for revolution. They should also be educated for mastery. That is control of ourselves and control of our destiny. And ultimately, perhaps even educated for war in the, in the pure military sense of the word as well. We must be prepared to defend our interests if it is necessary, necessary on a military basis. We must think the unthinkable. And even though for many people our, our confronting Europeans in that position seems unthinkable, we must think that mm -hmm. and we must prepare for that, hoping that it will not have to happen, but prepare, preparing for the possibility that it will happen. The other thing when we talk about the education of black children is this world order now that is under the influence of European is a rotten, stinking, backwards world order. It is a regressive world order. It is built on racism and rape and robbery and killing and murder and lying. Uh, it is built upon a threat to, to life on earth itself. We mistakenly perceive these people who are in control of this earth today as being normal and civilized when they perhaps represent the most depraved group to ever be in a position of influence in the world. This group must be removed and their values must be replaced by a new set of values. That means that our children must not only be motivated to share in jobs with Europeans and get equal pay in a rotten system, they must be prepared to transform this system and to bring into being a new world order, a new set of values. So, uh, and, and therefore, again, they cannot have the same education, the equal education, and the kind of nonsense we hear people rattling off about time and time again. Uh, if we have been the victims of racism and the victims of all the things we complain about, when we move in the in a position of mastery and influence in the world as African people, then we should be the people who are most sensitive to creating a world that is not dependent upon racism and lies, rape and robbery, you see. Mm -hmm. So consequently, I truly need an Afrocentric education because it means bringing into being a whole new set of values and priorities. One other thing I want to mention in, in, in that, you, you uh, and that is this, that we've been knocked out of every economic niche in this society. 
You will see uh, almost every ethnic group in New York City having some kind of niche. One group has got the newsstands, another group has got the vegetable stands, another one has got fish and chips market, the other one's got the uh, grocery stores, and the other one has got this, and other one has got that. And you know about the only thing now that's left to black people is the selling of drugs? Because, in a sense, uh, 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 because literally the economic niches in this town have been identified with another group of people. The Italians have sanitation and construction, and this one has this one and that. We have to realize that we are going to have to do one or two things in this town. We are going to eat. Two things have got to happen in here, and this is one of the reasons why you have dropouts, uh, Gary. The real reason you have dropouts in this city is because it is politically necessary for black people and Hispanic people to drop out. Because the... Let's ask it this way. What would happen if you graduated 95% of black and Hispanic students in New York City? You know, one of the things that basically would happen, given this economy, they wouldn't have any jobs. So it's easier to say they dropped out, they quiturated, or anything else, and therefore they're not working because of this, than to have them graduate, be prepared, and then to tell them they can't work. You see, you see what I'm saying? And so often this dropout is a cover to to cover a political situation. Yes. Our guest is Dr. Mm -hmm. Amos Wilson. We're running just a couple of minutes oh, over in the news, but stand by mm -hmm. because I know that we have a number of people who are standing by to talk with Dr. Wilson. When we come back, we will move immediately into your telephone calls. Those of you who have been holding on, we certainly appreciate your patience. Stand by. I'm sure it'll be worth the wait. 1190 WLIB, World Leadership in Broadcasting. I'm Gary Bird. My guest this afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson. Our topic this afternoon, educating uh, black children according to their own psychology and psychological stereotyping and its effect on African people. We'll come back after this at 1190 WLIB World Leadership and Broadcasting, the place where nobody does it better. WLIB Radio in the Key of Life on a Monday, May 9th, 1988. I'm Gary Bird. Our guest this afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson, psychologist, author, professor, and entrepreneur at the Harlem Graphic Arts Center. Joining us this afternoon for the second part of our topic dealing with the education of black children according to their own psychology. And this afternoon, taking a look at the, psycho the effects of psychological stereotyping uh, on us as an African people. And taking your calls at 692-9542 and 1-800-332-1022. Without any further ado, we'll move right into your telephone calls. I again thank those of you who have been holding on quite patiently this afternoon. Go right ahead, please. You're in the air at WLIB. This is the experience. Good afternoon, guy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Okay, I'd just like to, um, to go back to that business of um, assimilation that you um, mm -hmm. spoke about earlier on. Yes. If I read you correctly, I think that you were saying that one possible reason for, for those of us who, who choose to, uh, to assimilate into the mm -hmm. system rather than to confront it is, 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 some, is rooted in some kind of a deep psychological trauma. You know, we would rather uh, go ahead and uh, marry our oppressors rather than to confront them. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just uh, speak to that a little bit more? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm... Thank you for the call. Often um, it's sort of a, if you can't beat them, join them kind of mentality <laughs> where people uh, lose confidence in their ability to steer their own way or to control their own destinies or where they, they've uh, been imbued with a deep inferiority uh, complex and uh, self-alienation and consequently they want to um, overcome that through an identification process uh, removing the color line is a part of that idea you know where the where the other people do not see them uh, you as different from themselves because many of us believe, consciously and unconsciously, that the reason why we are suffering is because we are black. And you hear a lot of people say, you know, they did it to us because we're black. Or, uh, if uh, this happened because, and, and this kind of approach implies that if I were not black, if I were not seen as black, then I wouldn't suffer this way. Then I wouldn't have to deal with the problems. And one of the shorthanded ways of doing it, of course, is by identifying with one's oppressor and trying to get one's op oppressor in a state of mind such that he does not see you as different. If he doesn't see you as different, then he treats you as he treats himself. And therefore, if he sees you and himself as one, that's what marriage is supposed to do, right? <laughs> where, where the two, where the couple is to act as one. 
And so we had to assimilate with these people to the degree that uh, they really don't see a difference. Then if they don't see a difference, there's no basis for discrimination. Discrimination is based on a perceived difference and, act, and acts on a perceived difference. And therefore, if we can identify with them closely enough, they will not perceive us as being different. They will not treat us as, as, as a, a, on the basis of difference. And we will then enjoy uh, the advantages that they have, we would escape our uh, circumstances. If you can add to that, perhaps mm -hmm. your your comment to me during the break, which may relate to this about overdetermined. Mm -hmm. I was uh, you, you mentioned uh, certain behaviors, um, and what I'm trying to what I mean by overdetermined is where a number of almost all of the systems operate to move you toward the same point. Uh, last week I was talking about media and I was talking about how the education system, of course, how the system is run on the basis of lies and how the media will have to lie as well. The schools will have to, to lie and misconstrue as well. The, uh, the criminal justice system must be unjust and the economic system <laughs> must keep you poor and all of these kind of things. And so each one of them supports the other. So it's not one system that is moving you in a particular direction. It's a whole bunch of things. The whole atmosphere is suffused with messages that are pushing you in a particular direction. So it's overdetermined in that sense. Mm. WLIB, good afternoon. You're in the air with our guest this afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson. Go right ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Bird. Thank you. Where are you, where you calling us from this afternoon, I'm by the way? I'm calling from Manhattan. Thank you. Uh, and to Dr. Wilson, uh, thank you very, very much, as usual. Uh, listening to WLIB, uh, I, I, I find confirmation of my thoughts and my ideas. Thank you. Uh, yesterday was Mother's Day, and I, I attempt to write, and I wanted to write something special for my mother who had passed. And I came up with uh, uh, this title for something that I had hoped to write, uh, uh, Psyche. Psyche. Mm -hmm. Do you hear? Yes, I uh, And uh, what, 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 it, what you came and said was that the psychological stereotype mm -hmm. uh, was uh, all those things that I have uh, uh, hoped and wanted to put to paper, and I will definitely... Uh, uh, listen longer but Thank my you. question uh, to you uh, mm -hmm. and i wish you could respond to it it is what is the psychological effect of the european theology to the people of color generally but mm -hmm. but the african people particularly right okay thank you for calling and thanks for the compliments uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, every institution in the system is geared toward one major thing, and that is maintaining the status quo. And the church and the religious system is no exception, as much as a lot of people would like to think uh, it is being. As long as the, the church and the religious structure is defined by Europeans and, and defined within the European mode, it is going to function to maintain European power. And of course, we've had many references about uh, that whole white Jesus bit and the whole uh, the way the theology is pitched and the writing blacks out of, out of uh, religion and being responsible for religion. And of course, all of those things are set up to maintain the system. The white Jesus, of course, uh, uh, set up to make us think of white as being defined and somehow holier and destined to uh, be greater than any other color uh, on this earth. Mm -hmm. But the theology and the theological schools, which many of our ministers go to, have a subtle way of indoctrinating white values and orientations uh, as such. Also, the way the church is defined, the black church is not only a large uh, religious institution, but it is really a very large economic institution, but it doesn't perceive itself uh, that way. It doesn't perceive itself uh, as a very large, a possibly large educational institution and cultural institution. And, and therefore, it, it assumes the restricted definition of, of Europeans. So while they follow that definition, they function even when they love still uh, to maintain the status quo in the system itself. Mm. Uh, boy, I tell you, each comment generates, I think, more and more questions, and I think our telephones prove it. 692-9542 of the nationwide toll-free number, 1-800-332-1023. I'm going to keep it moving for those of you who are standing by for you to quick, respond. Quick sentence, uh, mm -hmm. because I think it's very important that we understand that the task that our youngsters um, 
In other words, as, as I pointed out last week, and I won't take long, I just want to say, say that um, it's not enough, as I said, to prepare for jobs and social mobility. Mm -hmm. You've got to prepare for the unthinkable, as we indicated. We've got to prepare for a revolution. We've got to prepare for the, for the idea that things may change. We must recognize one thing, that assimilationism and integrationism uh, generally tends to work quite well when there's enough to go around. Hmm. But uh, when economic circumstances change, um, attitudes change, and uh, we must think uh, as, as a people in terms of what would happen and what could possibly happen if the economic system collapses and falls apart. Where will we be uh, as a people? And, and we must educate our children in those terms. But about New York City, I wanted to point out Again, because I want people to think and start in their discussions about education in terms of the functions of the dropping out of black students and how that serves the political function. And to recognize that if we graduated a high percentage of black and Hispanic students uh, where they could successfully compete with other ethnic groups, you have a problem. And that problem is one that either the economic system of New York City must expand to such a degree that it can take in these additional graduates, or at least the country must provide opportunities mm -hmm. so that these graduates can go out away from the city, or we must knock some of the other ethnic groups out of their positions. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and again, we have to think of educating our children for these two possibilities. It may be that we have to educate them to be prepared to push others out. Or to create their own, I guess. Or to create and a uh, combination of both. Yes, exactly. Because this has been a part of the tradition of this country. So I'm not talking about some. No, it's happened before. There's yeah, no question definitely about that. Definitely one yeah. group. Re but and every group that has moved into power and influence in New York City basically has replaced other groups, as those groups mm -hmm. have moved into other positions in other places. But when it comes our turn, it seems as if everybody sort of gets stuck in place. 26 minutes <laughs> after the hour, 3 o'clock. My mm -hmm. guest again, Dr. Amos Wilson at WLIB. I'm Gary Bird. This is Experience 3, the Great Black Expedition segment of our radio magazine. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Jamaica, Mr. Gary. Thank you. Go right ahead, please. I respect you and I respect Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Gary, can I go can I, to a question for you and a question for Dr. Wilson? Let me just uh, say to you, probably it'd be very quickly just to get a question for him because there are just so many people calling. There's just not enough time. Uh, okay. Okay. Dr. Wilson, you, you, you spoke about the various ethnic groups that have taken over the... Mm -hmm. uh, the vegetable stores and the newsstands, I yeah. suppose you mean the Koreans and the Indians and, mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, the Indians from India. Mm -hmm. And um, there, and, and I look and I see that academically, uh, for instance, I think the last Westinghouse academic uh, achievement, whatever they're called, contests, uh, something like eight out of ten were, were uh, uh, are Orientals. Right, I recall. And who, who look different mm -hmm. from the Europeans. Right. And uh, their culture also certainly is not taught in the schools. Mm -hmm. And is there something that we can learn from the, from the Koreans, from the Japanese, from the Chinese, from the Vietnamese, mm -hmm. from the Indians, yeah. um, who, have, who have come to this country after we did? Yes. We were here before they were. Mm -hmm. And yet, and even even the the African Caribbeans mm -hmm. um, seem to have have moved ahead academically, yes. economically, mm -hmm. and uh, I would suspect that uh, since usually uh, uh, economics comes first and then political power mm -hmm. comes after it, is a result of it. Yes. Uh, what is it that we can learn from them that they have done? Mm -hmm. that perhaps we can do. Okay, good question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, very much. I think I might have indicated in the last program, I uh, alluded to what I call deculturation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the removal of the depriving uh, of African Americans of the African culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we, we've talked about that in the context of, of slavery. Because you remove that culture in order to create the servant mentality and to help people almost think of servitude as a natural, uh, uh, natural uh, slot for them in life. Another one of the functions, of course, of that is uh, consumerism. <clears throat> There's an international division of labor in the world. And the, the position for African people is that, a, uh, uh, is that of pro producers of raw materials and as consumers. 
And to be the ultimate consumer, you almost have to have a polyglot of tastes. Because one thing culture does is to also define your taste and to define mm -hmm. your values and mm -hmm. to define your orientations. And that has an effect on the way you spend money. And uh, consequently, if you want to make a person the consummate consumer, you make consumption becomes his defining activity, not his culture. And therefore, anybody who has a culture can come and sell that kind of person anything because uh, their culture is created by fads and styles and things of this nature, not by an enduring sense of themselves. So what you have then is people with a culture, people with a sense of culture, people with a sense of peopleness coming into our deculturized community to a great extent and, of course, exploiting that community because of its very decultur uh, deculturized uh, nature. I have also indicated that we support aliens because we have been alienated uh, from ourselves. When we, have been, when we are separated from ourselves as African people, there is a gulf created in our personality, an emptiness created in our personality, a lack of identity created in our personality. That gulf, that emptiness, that void motivates us to fill it. it and that void is filled in then by those stereotypes that we talked about earlier. Hmm. And those stereotypes take on a life. They have an appetite. They, they, the stereotype has desires. And those stereotypes are from ourselves. When we, have been, when we are separated from ourselves as African people, there is a gulf created in our personality, an emptiness created in our personality, a lack of identity created in our personality. That gulf, that emptiness, that void motivates us to fill it. it and that void is filled in then by those stereotypes that we talked about earlier. Hmm. And those stereotypes take on a life. They have an appetite. They, they, the stereotype has desires. And those stereotypes then literally take over our bodies, possess our bodies, and move us toward the support of their creators. You see, once the white removes you from your African identity, you still have a need to be, to be identified. <laughs> now then, what he does then is to create the image of, of the nigger. Mm -hmm. Okay? And since he's in control of information and we see him as an authority figure and, and he's rewritten history and redefined the social system, often many of us then believe the lies, you see. And we assume the definition. And when you assume a definition, when you believe a lie, let me just illustrate it like this. Uh, when, when a, you have to be given a description of a God before you can feel that God. And when you get that description, you can, you can undertake the characteristics. You see, when these people stereotype us and we begin to, to believe the stereotype, the stereotype is not just a system of ideas. The stereotype actually becomes a body experience and a behavioral orientation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and therefore, the lies that we believe, those lies take on a personality in us and become, in a sense, our personality. Or our culture. Uh, so. Yes. And, 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 and those those lies as personality are under the direction of their creators mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. therefore they will move our behavior toward those cre uh, those creators to maintain those creators as, su uh, uh, as such the solution then to this kind of problem is the rediscovery and re-identification with our african culture and with our african identity uh, as a people mm -hmm. and to recognize that we have a right to protect our interests. I was speaking with someone here the other night about the raising of money. And we were talking about the system, the Susu system and other African systems that we as African Americans have lost to a very great extent. And therefore, we have a great problem raising money for our businesses and so forth. You see, it's not enough just to have money. An economic system is based upon a set of social relations. It's the social relations that come first, even prior to the money, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. see. And so while we have the money, we don't have the requisite social relations, and those social relations are defined by culture that makes us able to use that money for our interest. We look at the scandal of us taking all of our millions of dollars to these white banks 
And these banks will not give a business such as my own a loan. And yet my people just lay the money into these banks. And these same banks use the money that black people put in them to build highways so that these jobs in the inner city can be transported out to New Jersey or somewhere where they can't even get to it. We finance the, in a sense, the, the, the devastation of New York City because we have not learned that we have to build another kind of banking system, an informal banking system among us as a people mm -hmm. so that we can use the money for our own advancement. But that can only be done when you have a sense of peoplehood, a sense of culture, and a sense of, of identity, which other people have, and they have not lost even when they inter uh, immigrate into this country, and they use it to exploit us who don't have that kind of sense. We are going to take a break for news headlines in the half hour, and there is more to come with Dr. Amos Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson, what is your time like this afternoon? I have it. Okay, I'm going to uh, take a very quick break, as I mentioned, and we'll also take a look to see about extending our time this afternoon with our guests, because by a way of the telephone calls and certainly the information that's coming across, I think it certainly would be expedient for us to do that. So please stand by. We'll come back and move right away into your telephone calls at WIB with Dr. Amos Wilson. I'm Gary Bird. There's more to come in this afternoon's experience. The Gary Bird Experience. It's 341 at WIB, Radio in the Key of Life, and I'm Gary Bird. You're inside of the GBE. It is a beautiful Monday, May 9th, 1988. Uh, great weekend, first day of the week, looking real good. I understand we'll have some rain a day or so from now. Uh, that's the bad news, but the good news this afternoon is that my guest, Dr. Amos Wilson, will be able to be with us uh, for an extended period this afternoon, and I made that move in light of uh, what certainly feels to be a, a very important vibration that is happening in the air, and certainly uh, some very, very important information for us to arm ourselves with as we move towards the 21st first century. So Dr. Amos Wilson will be with us extended past four o'clock this afternoon in order to uh, take care of the many telephone calls and certainly to give him the opportunity to sort of expound uh, as is necessary on the points that are raised this afternoon. WIB, I'm Gary Bird. Let's move into your telephone calls. Please let us know where you're calling us from first of all this afternoon inside of the experience and make it a point to keep your radio turned all the way down and keep your ear to the phone. Go right ahead please. You're in the experience. Uh, good afternoon, Gary. Thank first, you. First time caller. I've listened to your program very often. Great. It's always Excellent. Thank you, brother. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from White Plains. Great. Thank you. Um, the doctor? Yes. yes. Yeah, Dr. Wilson, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I purchased your book um, some time ago, and Thank of you. course it's one of one of the foremost books that I've, I've written. Okay. Uh, I've read part of me. It <laughs> seems you. as if I've written it because <laughs> it coincides with so much that I actually believe in and try to practice. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question is directed to, to, to first I'll, I'll make a brief remark, and I'll be brief. Five cents, please. Oh, okay. That, that caller's in a pay phone, so we'll let, let him get that together for just a moment. 343, 17 minutes before 4 o'clock. Uh, Gary? Yes, go right okay, ahead. Okay, yeah. The remark is just this, that we as a people, we seem to be so outwardly, outwardly directed mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of things that we seem to seek validation from other people, yeah. we, we have a tendency of trying to be accommodationist mm -hmm. and integrationist. Mm -hmm. It seems as if our reality is being defined for us instead of the... Uh, defined by ourselves and I'd like the doctor to just um, briefly uh, tell us how does that that being outwardly directed in the, our our progress mm -hmm. and also does he find that nations um, have that characteristic also of being either outwardly directed mm -hmm. or inwardly directed as I believe some oriental groups seem to be yes Okay, thank you for your call. Thank you. The, uh, certainly one of the, the processes that happens to the uh, psyche of, of, um, of African people under oppression is what I call the externalization of the personality. In, in order for us to be controlled by other people, particularly psychologically controlled, we have to be what I call externalized uh, and reactive, you see. Uh, so that um, our basic behavior is not a behavior motivated by internal drives and internal determinations, but by uh, the need for external acceptance, the need, as he indicates, for external approval, uh, the fear of being rejected by people outside of ourselves, and the sense that we are nobody until those people accept us and, and recognize us, a feeling of invisibility until we are seen by our uh, oppressors. And when we let another people define reality for us and, and define us, 
uh, as persons, uh, then naturally they would define us in such a way that um, it would make us reactive to them. You can see this operating on many different levels. He mentions the uh, sense of nations. To a good extent, uh, exter uh, colonialized nations are externalized nations mm. economically. Mm -hmm. uh, you see their, their, even their basic economic infrastructure, such as their railroads or their highways, were built not to build a network in within the nation itself, but were basically constructed so that their raw materials could be taken to the port cities and exported. So the construction of the railroad lines and construction of highways and so forth were not uh, constructive in a way that was uh, conducive to the growth and development of those societies. So you have a situation often where a certain segment of, say, an African nation may be literally cut off from its own marketplace by the way the highway and other systems have been designed, because they've been designed to meet external needs. And when we even talk about foreign aid, uh, infrastructural aid, often if that foreign aid is used to, uh, to build an infrastructural system, it's still built in a way to serve the interests of people outside. And then when you hire people to direct such an economic system, the local bourgeoisie that's going to direct this system will be externalized too because it serves as the comprador group or the between group that mediates the exploitation of the nation with the metropolitan and they are going to get their cues and so forth from the outside as well. And if they're in charge of the education of, of, the, of their children and so forth, they, of course, create in their own image an externally oriented uh, uh, children. In order for us to fall under the control of the other people, we have to be externalized. And a part of that externalization process is deculturation, you see, because culture and a sense of culture and identity gives you a set of purposes and goals and directions in which to move. But if you don't have that deep sense of culture and people identity and sense of peoplehood, then you, you're you going to have to get your control from outside on a reactionary basis. So in essence, then you cannot be truly inner directed, inwardly directed, right. without that sense of culture that you're that, describing. Yes, that sense of identity, a, a sense of, a solid sense of self. Otherwise, it's a reactive uh, orientation. 1190 WIB, radio on the key of life. Well, wait a minute, though. If, if that's the basic understanding, then, mm -hmm. then that says that that is the basic state of mind mm -hmm. that we, generally speaking, are operating in as a people in this society. Yes, very much so. Two things happen. Uh, those who essentially are, are deculturated, and, uh, of course, which is a part of a major reason why we have a dropping out in these schools mm -hmm. and a major reason why some of our children are not progressing academically the way they should, you see, because of that loss of people. Then you have another group that appropriates an alien culture, you see. Mm -hmm. So there are some of us who identify with the European culture and kind of take it over. And we can progress on, quote-unquote, on those values, you see. Uh, but, the, but the situation is, w what we're going to do within, with that alien identity, even though we may make it to be the CEO of AT&T and all that, it's, it means that we're just, the, the uh, output of our labors will still go to the other people. What happens in the, the rare case mm -hmm. of the person who is able to um, move through the phases that we're describing mm -hmm. in the quote-unquote upwardly mobile model mm -hmm. and yet who in arriving uh, at that peak mm -hmm. somehow does maintain a sense of his or her Africanness at mm -hmm. that position. What's at work in that individual? Well, there, and, and there are a number of people like that. As a matter of fact, when I talk about the education of black children, I also have that as a dimension. Mm -hmm. Those who with a sense of consciousness, can move into the, the system as an intelligence operation, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as uh, secret agents, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as, and in an extreme sense, sometimes where they may be superficially even identified as being with the other people in order to attain the kind of information, knowledge, or technology, or whatever else we may need mm -hmm. uh, as a group. We, it's a very tight line between, you know, uh, working, because the system has some things we could use, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. The, so the idea is, how do you 
uh, educate some of us such that we can work with it smoothly and yet at not at the same time lose our identity to it and and use it as a as sort of like a mold in the sense of using it and transferring out of it those things that are of value. Because, you know, right now we are the most valued employees in this country. And one of the reasons why we are valued, because we, we don't have that strong sense of peoplehood and the pan-African connectedness. Um, too many employers don't have to worry about us shipping that information out to some other country or making some kind of connection. We can work in gun factories, as many of us do, and yet not ship weapons to South Africa so that our people can engage in war. Uh, when you deculturize the people, they make this kind of employee. They'll die with tremendous amounts of knowledge and information in their heads. Uh, we, I, I was having the discussion the other day when we were discussing investments of the many uh, of us who sit in positions, but because we are isolated and cut off from one another, we can't give each other vital information and input so that we can uh, use the system to our advantage. Hmm. Part of the education of our children is to educate them in this way. 1190 WIB, Radio McKee of Life. Our guest this afternoon, Dr. Amos Wilson of The Experience. I'm Gary Bird. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from the village of Harlem. Thank you.